right, so it is my pleasure to welcome you to the 13th Annual President's Dream Colloquium at SFU. I had the privilege of attending the first session a couple of weeks ago that was an opened by the president of SFU, um, Andrew Petter. Um, so I'm very honored to be here tonight. I'm, my name is Tanya Bubala. I'm the, the Dean of the Faculty of, of Health Sciences. Um, the first thing I'd like to start with is our territorial acknowledgement. So I'd like to acknowledge that we stand here today on the traditional unceded territories of the Coast Salish peoples. And actually, I started um, this morning in the, in the roundhouse at, uh, at Musqueam First Nation. So it's quite wonderful to come from Musqueam up the mountain here onto, um, onto Squamish and tsleil uh, territory. So um, the theme of this year's colloquium, as you all know, is HIV from cell to society. And it's really representative of the fact that SFU is an innovator in HIV research and home to some of the world's leading thinkers on issues related to HIV, including tonight's uh, keynote speaker, Sabrina Brume. But I would also like to acknowledge Professor Bob Hogg, who has uh, an Order of Canada this past year um, because of his work with, uh, on HIV AIDS and, uh, and with the community. So it's, it's a real privilege to be at SFU where we're an interdisciplinary health sciences faculty whose motto is also from cell to society. And we had uh, a strategic planning process last year where we came together around the challenges in health that are going to face us moving forward and where SFU can contribute. And of course, infectious diseases is one of those global challenges that um, we identified as being a real key research strength for our faculty and for the university. And what I thought was most interesting was it wasn't just, uh, it wasn't, not, not, not just, I shouldn't say just, but it wasn't solely focused on HIV AIDS. It was what can we learn from our experiences with HIV AIDS and the successes that we've had in this arena, even though there's still so much more to do with emerging threats that are, um, that are coming out um, to confront our global communities. So, the center um, of SFU's Interdisciplinary Research Center for HIV is unique. Um, it brings together researchers, students, and community partners, and community investigators in multidisciplinary, or I'd like to say interdisciplinary programs that span all aspects of HIV research. Uh, it includes clinical research, biomedical research, access to and quality of health services, and HIV among key affected uh, populations. The center is really exemplary um, in reflecting um, SFU's uh, Faculty of Health Sciences innovative interdisciplinary health research model. So um, before we would begin, I'd like to thank the members of the SFU Interdisciplinary Research Center for HIV. There are apparently here too many to, to thank, um, but I think many of them are here in, um, in the room for um, their work and leadership in putting together this colloquium of which tonight's session is one. I'd also like to thank the faculty and staff who have organized and supported this colloquium, including the SFU President's Office, the Office of Graduate and Postdoctoral Studies, the Office of the Vice President, the BC Center for Excellence in HIV AIDS, and all other sponsors and supporters um, that will be listed behind me on the slide. So, it is now my great pleasure to uh, introduce tonight's keynote speaker, Dr. Sabrina Brume. So, Dr. Brume joins the Faculty of Health Sciences at SFU. He, she joined first as an assistant professor of molecular epidemiology of infectious diseases in sep September 2009. Since that time, she has, based on her research trajectory and record, um, risen incredibly rapidly um, through the ranks. She's currently an associate professor and holds a Michael Smith Foundation of Health Research Scholar Award. Um, she is so much more than that. She is currently on secondment as the clinical lab di director to the BC Center of um, Excellence. Um, this was a bittersweet moment for me because um, in some ways, I'm, I'm losing her from, from classroom teaching and, and service activities within the faculty. But at the same time, um, through this partnership um, and her secondment, we are strengthening our research collaborations and partnership with the BCCFE, which I think is of benefit to everyone in our community. 
Her uh, research integrates molecular biology, epidemiology, and computation approaches to study HIV evolution with a view towards understanding how selection pressures have shaped the virus's evolution over the course of the epidemic and developing an HIV vaccine. So we're very honored to um, hear from her today on towards an HIV cure, challenges and prospects, and welcome to all of you. Thank you. I turn this off, right? Yeah. Is that right? Okay. Um, thank you very much, Tanya, for the very generous introduction. And thank you very much, Bob, for the opportunity uh, to speak today and to the organizers of this great um, symposium. And, and thank you all for traveling up the mountain um, on this dismal evening. Um, I have been tasked with giving the opening, oh, uh, how do I? <laughs> I probably have to do something. Ah, yeah. So I've been tasked with giving the, the first lecture of this series, and it's a bit daunting because I'm talking about HIV cure, and the reason that that's daunting is because we don't have one. <laughs> <laughs> But here I am, uh, and I will at least, what I will do today is try to give an overview of the strategies that we are pursuing towards this, this ultimate goal. Um, this is the main message. We don't have a cure. Okay, so if there's one thing that you take away from today, it's this. We're not there yet. Um, however, Scientists, healthcare providers, and community are actively working together towards this goal, and it is together that we're going to get there. So HIV cure research is actually the number one area of research in the biomedical sciences in HIV uh, research today. There are, for example, funding agencies specific for HIV that are now solely funding biomedical research in this area only. Um, and there are numerous large uh, funding agencies uh, around the world who are putting um, extensive investments into large collaboratories and team grants of scientists that are working together towards this goal. Uh, it's a defining feature of all of these collaborations uh, um, that scientists, clinicians, and members of the community work together uh, in this endeavor. So my talk today has two parts. Um, the first part, unfortunately, I had to go through some details about the biology of HIV. I'm gonna to try to keep this to the minimum necessary in order to understand uh, why we're pursuing the strategies that we're pursuing in the arena uh, of HIV uh, cure. So this part of the talk is called HIV Latency 101, why current therapies uh, don't cure. So really we have excellent medications that can be used to control HIV uh, infection. However, those treatments are not curative and a cure will be something very different than the antiretroviral medications that are currently used uh, to stop HIV from uh, replicating in someone who has the virus. And then part two, this is the longer part, I'm going to talk about some of the strategies that are currently being pursued towards an HIV cure and I'll talk about where those strategies are at in the pipeline. Some of them are really still at the stage of, you know, the petri dish, <laughs> but some of them have advanced to clinical trials. So. This is, a, I apologize for the biology, but I have to give an overview of the life cycle of HIV. And those of you who just heard Ian's lecture, this is, you just heard this, but uh, HIV is an enveloped retrovirus. All viruses, in order to replicate themselves, have to enter into a host cell, have to infect a host cell and use that cell uh, as a, a vehicle to make new copies of itself. HIV is no exception. Uh, HIV first, enters and infects a specific kind of T cell in your body called a CD4 positive T cell. I'll go into a tiny little bit of detail here because it'll come back. In order for HIV to enter into a cell, that cell has to possess two specific receptors on its outside. The first one is CD4, that's the orange one shown there. That's why HIV infects CD4 positive T cells because they happen to have the receptor that will let it in. But you need another receptor. That's the one that looks like a snake 
Uh, that one's is called CCR5. Cell's gonna have both. The cell has both, HIV can make its way in. Okay, so the CCR5 receptor, that green one, that one's gonna come back at the end of the lecture. But then the virus gets in. The virus is special in that its genome is made out of DNA. That's a little bit weird. Most organisms and most viruses actually have, oh, sorry, the genome is made out of RNA. Uh, most organisms, including us, uh, and most viruses actually have a DNA genome, but HIV is a little bit weird. Uh, it has an RNA genome. Um, and we reverse, the virus reverse transcribes its RNA genome into double-stranded DNA. And then that double-stranded DNA copy of the virus goes into the nucleus of the host cell and inserts itself there, integrates itself there. That is an irreversible process. So this is a nasty virus that actually takes its genetic material and inserts it into ours. Most viruses don't do that. Only retroviruses do that, okay? After that, usually what happens is the cell turns into a virus factory, produces new virus particles, and usually after all this is finished, the whole process takes about one to two days, usually after this the infected cell dies or it's eliminated by the immune system, okay? If this happened in every single case where a virus infected a cell in someone's body, well, we would have cured HIV already. We would have figured it out, okay? But I'll tell you why uh, we haven't figured it out yet. I will, however, for the next two slides, I have to do a really, really short segue. So I, I'm gonna do a very short segue into antiretroviral treatment. So currently, there are over 40 individual drugs that are licensed to treat HIV. They're shown here. Um, many of them have been co-formulated into a single pill taken once a day, but that one pill will have at least three medications, individual medications formulated together in it. Um, and um, the way that these drugs work is as follows. I'll show you the life cycle again. All of these drugs work by blocking an active step in the virus life cycle. So if the virus is going through its life cycle, we have drugs, for example, that can block the virus's ability to enter the cell. We have drugs that will block reverse transcription, drugs that will block integration, and drugs that will block a post-exit maturation step that involves the virus protease, right? So the HIV medications, you would take three drugs from at least two of these classes, and all of them work by actively stopping the virus from doing something in the life cycle. This is important because, and here's where it comes to HIV cure, sometimes in a very, very, very small number of cases, inside someone's body, a virus will infect a cell, reverse transcribe, integrate its genome into the host cell, and then just decide not to do anything else. Okay, so what we have here is a cell that has a copy of the virus genome in it. And that cell is just sitting there. It's not doing anything. Okay, but that viral genome problem. So these cells that harbor these copies of copy of HIV in it, these are called latently infected cells. Or we also sometimes call them virus reservoirs. And the problem with these things is that, I'm sorry for this acronym CART, that's combination antiretroviral therapy. The drugs that are used to treat HIV infection, they can't touch these, okay? Because all the drugs do is stop some active step in the virus life cycle. But as you can appreciate, there's nothing going on here. There's nothing to block. So the drugs that we currently use to treat HIV cannot touch these. Similarly, the immune system cannot recognize a cell when it's in this state because it's not doing anything. It's not expressing any virus protein. So these, these latently infected cells are invisible by the, to the immune system and untouchable by drugs. The problem with these cells is they can hang out forever. Okay, they can persist for years. They can even divide because that's what cells do. And then they would divide along with a copy of the virus inside its own genome, okay? And the problem with these cells is that one day they can decide to finish the rest of the life cycle. They can reactivate and then release infectious virus particles. And we cannot predict at this point when this is going to happen. 
It is for this reason that antiretroviral therapies need to be maintained for life, because these reservoirs exist in every single infected person, and it is a certainty that it's, if a person discontinues the use of their medications, some of these will spontaneously reactivate, and then we'll have viremia again reseeded. Okay? So therapies alone are not a cure. Um, what I will do for the next couple slides is I'm just going to now move to, it's still, it's still the biology part, um, but I'm going to talk about the dynamics of virus replication at the level of the individual. So the first set of slides is, you know, what's going on when an individual virus infects an individual cell, so at the cellular level. This is at the level of a person. Okay, so at the level of a person, the, the majority of HIV infections that are sexually acquired, at least, um, infection is actually initiated by a single productive founder virus particle. I mean, that's not to say that during transmission of one virus is transmitted from a, a donor to a recipient. Probably not. Probably a bunch of viruses are transmitted. But on average, if infection starts in the next person, everything descends from a single founder virus. So you can trace it back usually to one. But you know, HIV is an RNA virus, mutations develop in its genome, and what happens over time is the original transmitted founder virus develops mutations within its genome, and we have this evolution of the virus that occurs within the person. And this evolution continues to occur as long as viral replication isn't suppressed, so as long as the person is not taking any antiretroviral treatment. So what is this is showing here is that it's the it's showing that the descendant virus population from the tra original transmitted founder virus is always changing, okay? It's changing as long um, um, as virus replication remains uncontrolled, okay? So we have the sequential replacement of the original transmitted founder virus with sort of mutated descendants thereof. But what's going on in the latent reservoir is a very, very different dynamic process. So we know from studies like that of the Mississippi baby that I don't have time to cover, uh, but you learned about it in class, um, <clears throat> we know that probably within hours or days of the initial infection event, the, the viruses that are circulating in the body, one of them will end up you know, infecting a cell and integrating and then stopping. And then after that, hanging around. Okay, so that's what we see here is this blue virus has made its way into the latent reservoir and it's just going to persist. And so on and so forth. Okay, so what's going on in the reservoir is an archiving and subsequent persistence of everything that has ever happened evolution-wise in that person, at least in theory. Okay, so what this is showing here is it's comparing and contrasting what's going on during active virus replication in the bloodstream. That's what's going on at the top of the graph. We have uh, um, uh, during, after infection, we have viruses replicating to high levels in the bloodstream and we have this evolutionary process going on. And then antiretroviral therapy is initiated such that plasma virus replication is reduced to undetectable levels, so that's why it's going down. But underneath this whole process, we have the seeding, maintenance, and persistence of the latent reservoir. In theory, the persistence of every lineage that has ever um, arisen in that, uh, in that person. And the problem is, as I said, um, if antiretroviral therapy is discontinued, we have a recrudescence of viremia. These old, archived, historic versions of the virus will come back within a matter of, usually on average, about two weeks, actually. It doesn't take that long. So, well, this is my last biology slide, and it's because I study evolution. Actually, it's even more complicated than that. What I showed you is a scenario here of the archiving and persistence of everything that has already happened, that has ever happened. And in some cases, it does look like that's what the reservoir looks like, a big fossil record, uh, except for it's not really a fossil record because fossils don't wake up, but these things do. Um, uh, but in others, actually, what's happening in the reservoir is a more dynamic process, and that's what's illustrated here. For, so, for example, in some people, certain reservoir lineages might actually die out. That cell might finally de decide to, you know, not exist anymore. But in other cases, some cells might slowly divide, thereby having that lineage persist. That's what's showing in the pink line. And in other cases, I mean, these are immune cells. Immune cells can proliferate in other 
in other cases, we can have a cell that harbors a latent copy of HIV and it decides to clonally expand, thus increasing the size of the reservoir. Um, so these are some of the challenges that biomedical scientists are facing because really, if we want to cure HIV, we got to get rid of, right, we got to get rid of these cells that are persisting here um, as integrated genomes in these cells. All right, that's actually it for the, the background biology. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to outline broadly some of the major strategies uh, that are being considered uh, towards achieving uh, an HIV cure. Before I do that, I will clarify some definitions because the nomenclature in this field is kind of confusing. So usually when we think of the word, when we think of the word cure, we're, you know, we're thinking of cure in the traditional sense. We used to have a condition or an infection and now you don't have it anymore, okay? So yes, we are using the word cure in that context, but we're, when we're talking about a cure in that context, we call it sterilizing cure, meaning a, a true cure, meaning a real cure, okay? So we are talking about cure in that context. Um, we're really, we're very, very, very far from achieving that goal, right? There's another way in which we're using the word cure, and this is the confusing part. Uh, we are calling this functional cure, or we're trying to not call it that anymore, but rather call it sustained HIV remission. And this is a state where technically a person will still be HIV positive because there will still be latent copies of HIV in their body. The virus will not be completely eradicated from them. However, we're hoping to achieve a state where these folks can discontinue use of medications daily but not risk viremia rebound, okay? So we're trying to move towards calling this HIV remission, okay? Current state where you can discontinue your meds, but don't, you don't have to worry about your virus coming up. We're also pretty far from achieving this, but we think it might be achievable earlier. Well, what are our successes so far in HIV cure? Well, depends if you're a pessimist or an optimist. So ooh, there are about 37 million people living with HIV worldwide. How many people have we cured? Well, functional cure, about 100. Okay, there's about 100 people who currently are in a state that matches the definition of functional cure. The vast majority of these people are in that, the, uh, uh, the vast majority of these people are people who have started antiretroviral therapy really early in their disease course, and then happened to discontinue their therapy for whatever reason. For most people it was accidental, although now there's some clinical trials of this. And when they discontinued therapy, the virus didn't come back. So they're actually called post-treatment controllers. So their, their, vire, their viremia is currently suppressed they currently don't need therapy, so that's positive. <laughs> the issue is that we actually don't understand the mechanism whereby we've actually achieved this. We don't know how to replicate it. Uh, most people who start early therapy do not have this phenotype, and the viremia current needs to be monitored on a nearly daily basis because as soon as your viremia comes back, you are at a risk of disease progression, but more importantly, transmission to others. So this is a precarious state that needs to be monitored. We don't understand how. We don't even understand how it was achieved, um, but we've achieved it in about 100 people. So glass half full, glass half, but that's where we're at. How many people have we totally cured? One, okay? So it's better than none, <laughs> but uh, admittedly a very small number. Uh, uh, even worse, um, the manner in which we cured this person is neither safe nor scalable, okay? So I, I don't have too much time to get into this, but um, uh, briefly, this uh, is a very famous man. Uh, he's referred to as the Berlin patient. Actually, his name is known. His name is Timothy Ray Brown. Um, and he was an HIV positive person who developed acute myeloid leukemia and actually the leukemia was going to kill him and then uh, the doctors realized that he needed a bone marrow transplant to save his life. And the doctors were very forward thinking and they found somebody who not only was a bone marrow match for this donor, but 
where the donor had a natural genetic mutation in that gene that encodes the second receptor that HIV needs to get into the cell, that receptor that looked like the, a snake. Um, the donor had a mutation in that gene such that the person's cells were actually resistant to HIV. So this patient was cured by a bone marrow transplant with HIV resistant um, stem cells. Um, however, that experiment has also never been replicated. So it happened in this particular individual. There have been a, very, a handful of cases where they have tried this experiment again with a bone marrow match and a uh, genetically mutated uh, donor cells. Uh, and in all cases, the, uh, the individuals have either not survived the transplant, there's about a 50% mortality rate, or they survived the transplant but were not cured. So we actually still don't know the mechanism. So. It's hard to say, <laughs> but yeah, so this is, this is, this is how, the, these are the successes we've achieved so far. Okay, so these are the broad strategies, okay? Um, one strategy, how are we gonna get rid of the reservoir? Well, first strategy, let's wake it up and then get rid of it, okay? That's the first strategy, kind of those two uh, things go together. So wake it up and boost the immune response to try to get rid of it. That's kind of one strategy together. I'll talk about that first. Then another strategy is actually the opposite strategy. Let's keep it silent forever. Okay, we're not gonna actually cure people. We could, that, that, we could only do functional cure. We do it that way, but it's kind of interesting. Two opposite strategies, wake it up and get rid of it or silence it, okay? Um, and then what might surprise some of you, Gene therapy, genomic editing approaches um, are also being pursued as components of cure strategies. Okay, so this is very, very different than, you know, a pill a day. These are very, very uh, intensive uh, uh, strategies. So I'll start with the first, waking up or reactivating HIV reservoirs. Um, waking them up, boosting the immune system to get rid of these uh, uh, reactivated reservoirs. These two strategies together are what we are calling shock and kill. Okay, I didn't come up with the name. Um, and so briefly, how this works is that we have these sleeping cells that have a latent copy of HIV in them, and then we deliver some kind of therapeutic, okay? This can be a cytokine, this can be a small molecule inhibitor, a small molecule that um, regulates um, uh, sort of chromatin remodeling. There's a number of different strategies, but uh, really all of them are delivering something that will wake up these latently infected cells so they start producing virus and start becoming visible to the immune system. And then we follow up with some strategy that will boost the immune system's ability to get rid of these things. Okay, and here I'll spend a little bit of time talking about the different strategies to boost the immune system because I appreciate that that's kind of vague. Um, however, this is not something that you would come in, take a pill, and then it's all finished. These treatments would be administered multiple times in series, and at the moment, uh, this you're looking at therapeutic vaccines and IV infusions of, you know, shock agents and so on. So these are intensive uh, uh, protocols, even in even in clinical trials. But I'll spend a little bit of time on the different strategies to uh, boost the immune system. The first strategy is a broad strategy called a therapeutic vaccine. Okay, so usually when we think about vaccines, we think about preventive vaccines or prophylactic vaccines. We usually think about vaccines, oh, that's a shot that you get when you were a kid. So then you don't, uh, uh, then you, to protect you against being infected with a pathogen later in life. So most of the vaccines that we know about are that kind. There is another class of vaccines called therapeutic vaccines. That is in the case if you have the infection already and you administer a vaccine to help your immune system fight it better. The shingles vaccine is an example of a therapeutic vaccine. It might be the only one, I'm not sure. There are not many, <laughs> okay? Uh, in all honesty, uh, people have been uh, talking about therapeutic vaccines for HIV for a long time. They're still actively being pursued, but the successes in this area have been very limited. Nevertheless, therapeutic vaccines are one way we're thinking of boosting the immune system. <clears throat> Another strategy is what we're calling immune checkpoint blockade. And this is kind of an antibody mediated therapy of sorts. But when the body, when the immune system is confronted with a, a chronic 
infection like HIV, right? It's a chronic persistent pathogen where the virus is just there all the time and your immune system is fighting it all the time. Well, to be honest, your immune system gets tired, okay? Your, your, your cells seriously get tired of fighting the same pathogen year, day in, day out, year after year. What happens when they get tired is they start to express these molecules that basically label them as being tired. That's why this green thing here, this, this green molecule uh, is the I am really tired molecule. Um, and if that immune cell is really tired, even if you present it with the antigen that it's supposed to fight, the cell will just not be able to do its job. It's going to be like, God, I just, I, I, just, you know, I just can't. So what we can do and actually, we borrowed this idea from cancer because the same thing happens there. You can deliver an antibody that will recognize that I am tired molecule, and that will reinvigorate the cell. And then when you show it the relevant antigen, the cell will then do its job, kill that antigen. So this is a way of reinvigorating your immune system, and it is uh, using antibody therapy against exhaustion markers. And this is directly borrowed from strategies that are in clinical trials and actually in use uh, for cancer. Um, here's another strategy, and it involves protein engineering of T cells. So usually cells of your immune system are, um, what is the word, um, <laughs> specific for specific pathogens, right? You have many different immune cells, but they have, a, they have a specific pathogen that they recognize. So most cells, most immune cells in someone who's infected with HIV will not be specific for HIV. Most of them will be specific for other pathogens. So here's an idea. How can we harness the power of immune cells that aren't normally specific for HIV and make them fight HIV? And the answer to this, we can engineer them with molecules that will help them recognize HIV just to bring them close enough to HIV infected cells and then you can harness their killing activity, right? So this is a way to engineer uh, immune cells that wouldn't normally be HIV specific and refocus them um, to be so, okay? And these, these are strategies that are currently more in the sort of um, petri dish side. Um, these are not in <clears throat> clinical trials will happen uh, soon. And the last I think this is the last immune boosting strategy, uh, is actually infusion of broadly neutralizing antibodies. And antibodies are molecules made by another cell of the immune system, B cells. B cells secrete these molecules that look like Ys, and the, each uh, antibody is specific for a specific pathogen or a part of a pathogen. And scientists have been able to identify and purify uh, antibodies that are very, very highly specific for HIV and help neutralize or deactivate the pathogen. Um, and these are being used as potential immune boosting agents in shock and kill strategies. Where are we at with shock and kill? Well, we're at the, we're at the, the stage of clinical trials, small-scale clinical trials and advanced studies in non-human primate models, non monkey models uh, of immunodeficiency virus uh, infection. So they've progressed beyond the lab. Uh, how successful have these trials been? Hmm. Not too successful. There are some glimmers of hope from the human trials, uh, but nothing to write home about yet. However, there was one paper published just last October in Nature by a very prominent group in the United States. It was in monkeys, not in humans, um, but 50% remission rates were reported in that study. It was in monkeys. Um, but that was astounding, okay? Nothing like that is being reported in human trials. And that was actually a combination of an innate immune shock, innate immune stimulating shock, uh, and a broadly neutralizing antibody kill. So it was a unique combination that wasn't part of the combinations that were initially tried. Um, so it's, uh, it, it, this is hopeful, okay? So here we are at with the next strategy. Um, and that is this opposite strategy. Well, instead of shocking and killing, what about permanently silencing the reservoir? What about, you know, delivering some agent that will put these latent reservoirs into an even deeper sleep such that even if they received very, very strong stimulus, they would still stay sleeping, okay? Wouldn't cure HIV, but you could achieve a state of 
remission, or what we're calling functional cure, um, there is one lead compound that's being pursued. It does look promising. It's promising in the Petri dish. It's promising in mice. I think the uh, research group in question is pushing hard for clinical trials, but I'm not sure yet. There's actually research in this very area ongoing at SFU by Ian, who gave uh, the lecture in the classroom earlier. So part of uh, the Faculty of Health Sciences uh, HIV research program is that Ian is leading an initiative to discover more of these compounds um, from natural sources. Um, but yeah, as of now, this is a very interesting concept but there is basically one compound, um, lead compound, uh, that is put, being put forward as sort of a proof of concept that this strategy uh, could, could potentially be feasible. Okay. <clears throat> and now the last set, um, the last set of approaches that, you know, I think is worth mentioning have to do with gene therapy and gene editing. Okay, so this is, this is a big commitment, right? Genomic editing approaches. There are two genomic editing approaches that are being considered uh, with respect to potentially achieving an HIV cure. And one is probably one that seems intuitively obvious. Well, if HIV physically integrates its genome into that of the host cell, well, can't we just cut it out, right? Can't we just get rid of the virus and cut it out, get rid of it? Um, sounds intuitively obvious. It's a little bit more difficult in practice. However, um, strategies are actually being pursued to do exactly this. And these strategies have been successful in vitro. Okay, so we have cured a cell line of HIV. Um, and there have been some successful trials in an animal model. Uh, and uh, studies in humans have been conceptually approved, but are still, you know, in the development. Some of you might recognize the name of this technology, CRISPR-Cas9. Um, it's a very new uh, genome editing technology. There was recently uh, reports in the news of a Chinese scientist who had used this technology to allegedly engineer human embryos that are resistant to HIV by using this technology to knock out the CCR5 gene, that gene that encodes for the receptor that looks like the snake. <coughs> we'll see if those pan out. But th this is part of, this specific technology is just the newest and now most widely adopted approach to achieve gene editing, but there are other approaches to do so. This is just the newest, fanciest uh, way to do this. Okay, so, but this technology is being tried to cut out HIV from the cell. There's another type of gene therapy that is being tried, and this is an older idea. This was the idea that we could engineer immune cells that are genetically resistant to HIV by knocking out the gene for that snaky looking receptor, right? That receptor, uh, and then, and then th th this um, was inspired originally by the one patient who has been cured of HIV because that person was cured by reinfusing, uh, regenerating their immune system with genetically resistant cells. So the idea was, well, maybe we could achieve this by engineering genetically resistant cells. So the technology that's being used to do this is not CRISPR-Cas9, it's an older technology, but essentially the technology achieves the same thing. This approach, has moved to cl clinical trials. The first clinical trial was actually published five years ago now. The approach is actually to have this th therapy done. Uh, cells are taken out, so by IV, to, so take the cells out, purify them, engineer them ex vivo, like treat them with the engineering agents ex vivo, and then infuse them back in, and then check to see um, uh, monitor to see their survival and how many of them have been edited. So the study, the initial clinical trial was published five years ago. It was a success in that it was safe, but the proportion of immune cells that were successfully edited was abysmally low, 5%. Um, so nothing near 
were what you would need in order to make a dent in HIV replication. Um, they're improving the approaches and clinical trials are ongoing now, but we're still a couple years away uh, from seeing new results in this particular area. Um, we also have had some, well, I don't want to call them false leads because science is like that, um, but we had a, a couple of studies that led to some hope that there was really a breakthrough, but it turned out kind of not to be the breakthrough uh, that we had hoped, and this is probably the most prominent of the scientific studies. One of the challenges with trying to eradicate the latent reservoir, with trying to get rid of these cells that have an integrated copy of HIV inside them, the problem is these cells don't exhibit any type of marker or any type of feature that would identify them to us as having a latent copy of HIV in them. If only these cells, you know, expressed some surface marker or had some property that would identify them to us because they're very rare, about one in a million, right? If we don't want to have some kind of therapy that targets everything, if only one in a million are going to benefit from that. So if only we could find a marker of the latent reservoir, and we have been searching for years and years and years, and then this paper came out in Science. CD32A is a marker of the latent reservoir, and the field went, what? CD32A? Um, which is really weird because that's a B cell marker and there was all these other weird things about it, but it came out in science and there was a for, for the next 18 months, a flurry of activity to try to capitalize on this result and to replicate it and so on and so forth. And um, it turned out to be a really complicated technical artifact. Okay, three papers published back to back a year later, basically saying, uh, no, sorry. Um, so we're, we're back to having no marker of the latent reservoir. But really, this would be the holy grail. If we could find some kind of marker, then we could target therapies specifically to those cells. But as you can appreciate, these cells are one in a million. We don't know which ones they are. It's tough, okay? So what's a cure gonna look like? Well, I can't tell you because we don't have one. But it's not gonna be a one size fits all. You take a pill and then you don't have HIV anymore. I can guarantee it. It's actually gonna be a complicated process. Um, and there's going to probably need to be a variety of approaches that are put together in combination in a way that might be even tailored specifically for you and your clinical history and other features specific to you, your reservoir size, your reservoir composition, your reservoir genetic diversity, your immunogenetic profile, and so on. Um, so this is a hypothetical diagram of what a possible cure might look like for someone someday. And it would be a functional cure. <laughs> okay. So the first component would be um, to begin antiretroviral therapy early, okay, as early as possible. Beginning antiretroviral therapy early alone is not going to be a cure for HIV, but we, there's strong evidence that it will limit the size of your reservoir. And if you've got a small reservoir, it makes sense that it might be easier to get rid of it, although that's not really been proven either. So early ART. After that, some kind of shock and kill strategy. Let's clear out as much as the re of the reservoir as we can. Okay, the easy stuff. Let's clear it out, get rid of it. Then, if there's any reservoir left, which probably there will be, or maybe at this point some kind of gene editing strategy, some kind of uh, a reintroduction of genetically engineered cells that are resistant to HIV, because then you reconstitute your immune system with something that can't HIV can't replicate in. And then, for the rest, block and lock. That silent strategy, that last recalcitrant portion of the reservoir that you just cannot get rid of, silence it. Okay, and thereby we achieve hopefully a functional cure. All along in this hypothetical set of treatments, ART would need to be maintained. And at some point in order to actually um, see if the strategy worked, we'd have to remove antiretroviral therapy and see if the virus would come back, right? So there are many, many, many different dangers and considerations uh, and challenges uh, facing us. Uh, but these are some of the pathways that you're, we're pursuing forward. So this is it. This is where we're at. We don't have a cure for HIV. Um, but the landscape is different from even, say, 10 years ago. 10 years ago, if you asked, you know, you think we're ever going to have a cure for HIV? Most people would say, no way. We're never going to have a cure for HIV. 
And now a lot of people believe it's feasible, it's possible. But not only that, a lot of people are working on it. In fact, most biomedical scientists in HIV have worked on it because that's where the funding is. <laughs> so, so I, I mean, I mean I, I've studied HIV evolution and now I'm studying HIV evolution in the area of cure because that's, that's where the opportunities are. So there's a lot of uh, people, people working on it. So a cure, if we ever get there, it's unlikely to be a single one-size-fits-all kind of approach. It's likely going to be a combination of methods, personalized approaches. It's going to be something intensive. Um, and that's kind of where we're at. Um, but to me, given all of this, um, I think this is the most important message. If we are ever to get there, scientists are not going to get there all by themselves. Okay? We have to do this together, okay? Because if you leave the scientists to go pursue the things that they're pursuing, sometimes you end up with strategies that are not really feasible, nor acceptable, nor palatable, right? <laughs> so they might be scientifically feasible, but somebody's like, what, gene editing? No thanks, right? Um, so in one way, um, I, I think that I, I am very hopeful that one day we will get to an HIV cure. And that's what I personally and many other people, many of my colleagues are working towards. But in the short term, the biggest um, success I think that I've already seen in cure research is that the research is actually being conducted from the beginning in a completely interdisciplinary way, in a way that biomedical research has never before been conducted. Here we are, a bunch of scientists, we don't have any strategies, where it's all at the petri dish stage, but all of these big scale initiatives are all collaborative uh, efforts between scientists, clinicians, patients, communities. We're all starting out together at the beginning and talking about this at an extremely early stage. So. In the short term, at the very least, cure research is helping us come together. I also hope that we will be able to achieve a cure, um, but I, I, am, I, am personally, I am personally hopeful. I think this is my last slide. Ah, yes, it's my last slide. Um, I want to thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you again, Bob, for the opportunity to talk about this, and thanks again, Tanya, for the, for the wonderful introduction. And I think hopefully we have some time. I anticipated that there might be questions, so hopefully there's some time for that. Very far to go. <laughs> Hi, uh, thank you very much for that. It was very interesting. I'm just curious in terms of are there any um, like very theoretical approaches you might not have discussed because they're so like you know far fetched with the direction mm -hmm. science is moving that might be even more you know not feasible to think about right now that like maybe in theory at some point. Um, I th what I covered today are. I would say the majority, I'm looking at Ian here, the majority of strategies, well, I don't know if most of them, uh, these are the majority of strategies that are currently being pursued that have gotten to some stage in the pipeline, even if that stage is the publication of a first scientific paper that something worked in vitro. Um, there are some other strategies, but I would say that they're too early to even, you know, I would say that most scientists wouldn't publicly talk about, you know, stuff that's at super early stages of development. Ian, would you, would you agree? Can you think? I mean, there are other variants, like this classification scheme of this, the, the way I categorize them, that captures pretty much all of the feasible strategies that are currently being pursued, but there's many different types, like, like immune boosting strategies. I didn't talk about every single one of those possible strategies, but they would all fall under these, these, these categories. Um, but I appreciate that question because, to me, genome editing is pretty, uh, I mean, that's not a um, low impact strategy, right? That is a, uh, that is a strategy that has substantial uh, implications and potential side effects. And um, this is part of the conversation that needs to be had. So here we have... Um, 
an infection that is manageable with one pill a day, where for not everyone, not for not everyone, but for many folks, that actually works quite well, not everyone. And here we are thinking about HIV cure by editing your genome. <laughs> and many people will say, is this, you know, should we, is, is this really something we should be pursuing? Because, you know, for me at least, um, my meds are working and I'm not going to sign up for genome editing clinical trials. No, thank you. Um, but for other folks, you, hear, you know, their medication isn't working. And I said, you know, I'm, I'm waiting for the day that I can not be HIV positive anymore. And I would be willing to sign up for clinical trials in genome editing because I really would like to see the day that, you know, I can be HIV negative. Um, so there's a lot of different perspectives and voices and it, it is because the strategies that are being pursued are so diverse and in some cases so intensive and in some cases have many potential side effects and off-target effects that I think the conversations are very important to have kind of at the beginning. So I don't think I answered your question. <laughs> there, yeah, there's, yeah. Thank you for sharing your knowledge. My question in terms of, you mentioned collaboration. How do you collaborate globally, like uh, places like India and China? We're supposed I get to, up uh, really uh, early in the morning and I <laughs> talk on Skype <laughs> to a lot of people. Even, gonna, yeah, <clears throat> actually, drug, yeah. Even with the drug companies, because uh, I know there was a time, I'm a medical statistician who has followed epidemiology. and. I, uh, when India started getting AIDS uh, patients in semi-China, there was a fear that it will be a, a nuclear bomb of AIDS. But then now they are almost out of the picture. You don't hear much. So you don't hear much about, I mean, still the focus is Southern Africa compared to re the rest of the world. And my second question is about in relation to uh, for example, Alzheimer's is still has no cure, but people have this feeling there is a cure, but there is no. Is there any kind of another health condition? I know it's not viral. Alzheimer is not a virus related, or we don't know. Or where we could borrow concepts from yeah. another field yeah. to uh, influence what we might try in HIV. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So, yeah. So, to, I guess to answer your first question related to um, sort of. Uh, whether HIV is still a public health issue because whereas, you know, 10, 20 years ago, every day we would have HIV in the news. Nowadays, it's much less talked about, almost to the point where, um, you know, I, 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 when I talk about, you know, I, I sometimes you know, people, oh, what do you do? Oh, I study HIV. And I'm like, hmm? That's still around? Like, people still get that? Right? Haven't, haven't, isn't that a solved problem? Right? So I, I appreciate your question uh, because I agree with you. Um, it's not a solved problem, but I'm seeing more and more in my, you know, interactions outside of the university that there, there is, it, sometimes I see this perception that, you know, HIV is a solved problem. People are surprised that people are still working, working on it. Uh, um, so I always say any, any chance that I get to talk about HIV and to remind, you know, to remind everyone that this is still very much an issue that affects a lot of people's lives and that we are very sure we have medications. Yes, um, that is a major uh, advance, um, but we still don't have a vaccine. We still don't have a cure. There's almost 2 million new infections per year, so we have a long way to go. Um, with respect to your second question, HIV is borrowing a lot of ideas from cancer immunotherapeutics. The cancer immunotherapeutics field is more advanced, um, um, maybe because there's more people working on it. So for example, the antibody therapy of the immune exhaustion markers is directly uh, borrowed from cancer. The caveat there, though, has to do with the very differential risk profiles of the two illnesses. So a lot of cancer diagnoses are terminal diagnoses and a lot of the strategies that are being pursued, it's like, well, the diagnosis is terminal, so the level of risk that you would undertake for a therapy is, you know, you would take a big risk. 
but HIV is very different. It's a chronic manageable illness where many people take one pill a day to completely manage and the level of risk doesn't match. So in some cases, and this is why we need to consider these issues, in some cases there's a worry that the strategies being pursued are currently too early in development and might have risk that exceeds the potential benefit from that. Um, so I appreciate your question so that I could make that secondary point. This seems like a silly question because I'm assuming that people have tried this, but why is, or how hard is it to create, say, monoclonal antibodies of the docking protein to train the immune system? Um, like, how do you, is there a reason why that hasn't worked? Why can't we elicit, like, HIV antibodies by vaccination? Um, <laughs> is, it, is it just that it's too variable in that docking protein, or is it? So, we, so we, we don't know. We have so far failed to elicit broadly neutral. So we can elicit HIV specific antibodies by vaccination. However, the antibodies that we're able to elicit will not neutralize HIV in most cases. And even when they do, will not neutralize the diverse strains that would be necessary to actually protect you against getting infected. Because you, you don't know what strain you're going to get infected uh, with. So ideally, you would want to elicit antibodies that would give you broad coverage. And we have no clue how to do that via vaccination. Um, there, I could give you an hour's worth of excuses as to why I have a lecture on that, actually, like why we have failed to, to uh, uh, deliver an HIV vaccine. Um, what is being pursued, actually, is to just cut out the whole, just cut out the middleman and infuse, because we know what antibodies work and we know their sequence. So as a stopgap, we are doing IV infusions of these antibodies, but that's not scalable, right? It's not really scalable. It, it isn't. Um, or we could do kind of a genetic engineering thing where we could deliver the gene encoding that antibody somehow and then get the trick the body into making that antibody. That's not really vaccination in the traditional sense, but it gets you to where you need to go, and those strategies are being pursued. Yeah. There's a, no, oh, there's one back there. Yeah, Hi, um, my question uh, is in regards to infants and whether this treatment um, process is feasible or if it is too dangerous um, for them. That's an excellent question. We have, uh, so I'm a member of a large collaborative team grant that's funded by the NIH and we have one pediatrician um, on our on our team. She's actually the pediatrician that uh, discovered, that reported the Mississippi baby. Uh, and she asks the same thing. <laughs> She's always, she is advocating um, in this case. So some of the treatments for HIV even lag behind in the pediatric setting. So the, the formulations available to infants is actually far less than those available to adults because they simply haven't been uh, evaluated sufficiently in those contexts. So there is a, there is a, you know, we're already, even though we don't have a cure and many of these strategies are still in the biomedical phase, there is a strong push to make sure that from the very beginning we're thinking about all the populations who might benefit from this and to keep them all in mind um, as we continue to move these strategies forward, including pediatrics. I think there was, there was a, you had one more question, is that right? Yeah. Do you have another question? Yeah. And I think maybe, should, how, how long? We started late, but I'm, it's I think we have five minutes. Five minutes okay, that's, yeah, because we started about 15 minutes late. Um, I mean, HIV is a unique disease because there's no spontaneous onset, right? It's not, it's not like cancer where you could just wake up one day and have it, if I'm understanding correctly. You have to be infected by someone else. Ah, uh, yes, 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 you can't, yes, in order to, yeah, you have to get HIV from, so you're not gonna wake yeah. up one day and just spontaneously have gotten HIV from the air. Or yeah, yes. <laughs> so what are the, I mean, through, like you mentioned, into professional collaboration, I mean, through, through that, through education, through preventative measures, is it possible to eradicate the, the disease that way? Hmm. Huh. So, it's hard, and so I'm, it's hard, so 
HIV is trans, one of the ways, one of the major ways that HIV is transmitted is through sex. And I think it is unrealistic on a global scale to by behavior changes, by advocating for behavior changes alone, we're not going to stop an, ep an epidemic that is, uh, that, is, uh, that is transmitted sexually. Um, I just don't think that's realistic based on my personal and academic understanding of human nature. So <laughs> is, that, is, that, is that fair? So I, I don't think, so yes, we fully understand how HIV is transmitted and what we can do to stop its transmission, but I don't think realistically to scale those only behavior change in those kinds of interventions, I don't think we're going to end the epidemic uh, that, that way. That's partially a personal opinion, but I think it's one that's shared by the many, you know, sort of uh, researchers in the field. Yeah. Tanya, oh. Oh, you can go before me, please. I don't want to. I don't want to take up a question time. So I want to talk about CRISPR Cas9 because this is just. Oh, CRISPR Cas9. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so my understanding is that it's the delivery mechanism for gene editing that is. Part, I mean, besides the off-target effects, which we're working on, but um, if you're using a, a, another form of virus, so an AAV virus, to deliver your your gene therapy, um, it's not necessarily that efficient. A delivery system. So you're using like an ad adenovirus to try to find that one in a million T cell that has HIV. So are people working on, I'm assuming that's why they're chip targeting germline editing, which is a whole other crazy issue. But are you working on different um, delivery mechanisms for gene editing? So the short answer to that is yes. People are working on different, different delivery mechanisms for vac delivery of vaccine immunogens and also different delivery uh, mechanisms for delivery of, of gene editing and other, other, other strategies. Um, there, there is not a preferred, so if you were to say, oh, well, what is the HIV field concentrating on to use for delivery of this. There is no consensus on what the, um, the best vectoring system is. Uh, and there's a number of uh, competing strategies, some of which are being used for both vaccine and gene editing delivery and some only, only for vaccines. Um, so can I just commend you on thinking about things from the toxicity effect? Uh, I mean, I know that Oh, with the risk others. with respect to yeah. the, yeah. I spent my career working in, you know, cancer immunotherapies, and there is such a, a, a toxic, toxic, toxic um, therapy um, that, you know, really sitting down with the patients to work out what yes. level of risk. So currently the immune checkpoint blockade strategies, they're extremely, they have a lot of big side effects. They are being used in an extremely limited setting in HIV and only relatively recently. They're only being offered uh, to patients who have extremely multiple drug resistant HIV where there are no other uh, antiretroviral based therapeutic options. So this is an immune boosting strategy uh, for those folks, but it's only, only, only for people with untreatable HIV, um, thankfully, the proportion of people who have extremely multi-drug resistant HIV is less now than it was earlier in the epidemic where the, uh, the suite of choices of drugs available to treat was much less. So thankfully now we have expanded choices and there's very few people thankfully who have, were resistant to everything, but there are some. <laughs> It's the 746. <laughs> no, 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 you, I was just joking. How about, I said, last question, because people want to go eat dinner. <laughs> so you said you're hopeful that we will eventually find a cure for HIV. And I wanted to ask if you think this is just a case of time. In 10, 20 years, however, you know, amount of time, if we continue to pursue the same strategies that are continuing to be pursued with all the brilliant minds that are at work on it, Will there be a cure, or do you think that there are external factors, like risks, that will get in the way of this scientific progress, whether it's lack of treatment available to, you know, half approximately of the people currently living with HIV? Is that going to give rise to mutations that will eventually make these strategies irrelevant or funding? Or basically, what do you think are currently the biggest risks hmm. as far so as not science, So from a scientific perspective, 
Um, I don't see why there's any reason not to be hopeful that given the large concentration of scientists around the world that are completely committed to solving this problem and time going by, that we'll make real headway in this, in this problem. Um, I, I, I think it's possible that we will be able to, you know, achieve HIV remission in one day an actual cure. I think it's, I think it's possible. In fact, if you talk to some HIV researchers, though, there's a lot of people who think that we're going to have a functional cure before we have a vaccine. And the vaccine people have been saying, oh, yeah, 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 since the beginning of the epidemic. And some people have given up on the vaccine people. But there's, there's researchers that actually think cure is more feasible than vaccine. I'm not sure. I'm kind of on the vaccine side. Um, will there be political and other hurdles? Right? Um, yes. Will there be funding hurdles? Like, you know, what if, what if the NIH decides to, well, not fund science anymore? Well, you, you, so is there the potential for hurdles? Yes. Uh, what can we do about it? Um, I think we could all take a lesson from Julio Montaner's talk and Val Nicholson's talk um, that opened up this lecture. We are all, you know, we are students, we are scientists, we are advocates, we are community members. Our job is to keep the conversation going, keep talking about HIV, keep putting pressure right, on the people who make decisions at the level of the government. Um, and that's how we're going to be able to work together to, to get there. We kind of just have to be loud, annoying, and kind of strategic. So hope that answers your question. <laughs>